They just taught French socialism. They did no harm, but they were informed on. And one morning, four o'clock, Dostoevsky woke up and a lieutenant colonel in the light blue uniform of the secret police was standing by his bed. Told him to get up, dress, searched, put in the Peter and Paul fortress. And an odd thing, neurotic young man, every sign of frailty. But he didn't break, didn't betray his friends. Others groveled, others lied. He stuck firm. He was sentenced to death, the famous mock execution to which the Tsar added some cunning touches, some cruel touches of his own, tied to a post in a white shirt. Blue sky, he said, blue sky. And a weather vane caught his eye, and he thought, this is life, this is living life, this is Jiva Jisn. And of course, the last moment, the troopers arrived and the execution was off and instead, four years penal servitude in Siberia. This was the great formative experience of Dostoevsky's life, which he recorded in his memoirs from the House of the Dead. Look at that boy. No one's ever cut no bits off him. No amputations. He looks worried. I bet he's got a lot of money. <laughs> In the criminal himself, prison develops only hatred, a thirst for forbidden pleasures, and terrible irresponsibility. Corruption and perversity, backbiting and scandal-mongering went on ceaselessly. This was hell, the nethermost pit and the outer darkness. It would be the same again tomorrow and the next day and every day for years until the moment of freedom came. But when would that be, you thought? And where was this freedom? The Dostoevsky prison world, the House of the Dead world, opens up, opens out into the world of crime and punishment and all the major novels. It's a world of cries, despairing, angry cries heard in the night. It's a world of coming and going, banging doors, drafty passages of whispering, quarrelling through thin walls, and the interiors, cheerless, always shabby, minimal, like Raskolnikov's room, yellowing wallpaper, with no, with much longing for home, but, but no home. There are no homes in Dostoevsky. Think of the stove for a moment, the Russian pechka, the hearth, as we would call it. There aren't any working stoves in Dostoevsky. They're either out or malfunctioning or poisoning people even. Beds are not for sleeping soundly on in Dostoevsky. They're for throwing oneself down on, for having nightmares on, being ill on, brooding sullenly or frenziedly on. He looked around his little room with hatred. He had withdrawn from the world completely, like a tortoise into its shell, and even the face of the maid, whose duty it was to look after him, exasperated him beyond endurance. Get up, sir! Get up! I brought you some cabbage soup. You must be starving. The mistress wants to go and complain about you to the police, sir. The police? What for? 
You know what for. You haven't been paying your rent, have you? She's a fool. I'll go and have a talk to her today. I dare say she is a fool, the same as I am. But why is it that a clever man like you lies about like a sack of coals? Why don't you ever do anything? But I am doing something. Are you now? Well, what is it? Working. What kind of work? I am thinking. <laughs> I swear to you that to think too much is a disease. A real, actual disease. Why do I say that? Well, we all show off with our diseases. Me, especially. And I say to you that every kind of intellectual activity is a disease, all right? Oh, but that's enough. Not another word on this subject you find so extraordinarily interesting. Thinking. Another character from another book. Dostoevsky invented the underground man, Podpolny Chelyviak. This is a 1987 figure, as modern as AIDS. We must think of vicious, spiteful thoughts. He introduces himself to us as spiteful, Yasloi. He just keeps talking. We must think of the idea of futility, the idea of no end, of no beginning, of a kind of non-sequential babble, an eternal meaningless nightmare present that is just flaunted. He's an indecent exposer of consciousness. He's a flasher. He's in the mind. He's one of those men who hide behind the gorse bushes as the girl golfers arrive and he comes out, but what can he flash at them? He's nothing to wave but, uh, but his consciousness. I'm very touchy. I'm sensitive and quick to take offence, like a hunchback or a dwarf. Oh, but there have been times when if somebody had uh, slapped me in the face, I might even have been glad of it. I'm serious. I used to go out and take pleasure in degrading myself. You want to know why? Because it was too boring to sit and do nothing. It's true. I imagined things. I invented a life simply in order to live. Well, how many times have I well, taken offence? Just like that. Deliberately. No reason at all. Just putting on an act even a couple of times when I simply longed to fall in love. Oh, I really suffer, gentlemen, I assure you. At the bottom of my heart, of course, I can't really believe in my own suffering. I feel a stirring of derision. But all the same, I, I do suffer. I'm jealous. I fly into rages. It's all out of boredom, gentlemen. It's all out of boredom. I am crushed with tedium.